I'm going to go through eight basic skills here that narcissists will never, ever, ever be able to master. You're definitely going to want to watch all the way till the end because, yeah, they can be weak too. I know it seems like they never are. I know it seems like they're so strong. It feels like it's not fair. You think they always get their way, but guess what? You are an empath, and I'm telling you, that is skill number one, that they are never, ever, ever, ever be able to master. They can fake it. They can even try to fake it till they make it, but they're never going to be able to. You know what they do? They kind of like try to take on the skills and whatever, but they're not fooling anybody. They're not even fooling you. And you're right up close to them. They're really not fooling anybody. And I mean, you naturally feel other people's feelings. You actually get to have real, genuine concern. You get to really understand a person's wiring. You get to genuinely put yourself in other people's shoes. And it's with a narcissist, it's genuinely like trying to ask a person to distinguish between the colors red and green if they can't. And so it's it's so sad for them because they are trying to feel what it's like to feel empathy, but they really can't. And so unfortunately, they're never going to be able to have that feeling of true empathy. And because of that, they don't ever have that feeling of true connection. And, you know, what they en end up doing is they kind of look around, they, they try to emulate it, but they really just don't actually ever feel it. So that is a basic skill that they'll never be able to master. And it's... Um, something that they really would like to be able to master. And so that is the first skill that a narcissist will never be able to master. And so if you're new here, I know that you're probably an empath. And so welcome to this channel. Make sure that you have subscribed here if you haven't subscribed before, because on this channel, we do empower individuals to become the best versions of themselves in all aspects of negotiation and in all, all aspects of, you know, sometimes the very first negotiation that you have to do, by the way, is with your own self or your own self-worth in the morning. When you're getting up in the morning, I always say, I can't ever leave my thoughts unsupervised because when you're negotiating, especially with difficult personalities, you have to stand strong. You have to stand in your power. You have to be the best version of yourself at all times. And you, that means you have to be on your game at all times, right? And that can be really, really difficult when they're constantly trying to knock you off your game and, you know, gaslighting you and doing all the things. So the second skill is self-reflection. This is a, a skill that they'll never master because inherently they don't want to have to be self-reflecting. It's very, very difficult for them to acknowledge their own flaws, to, to look deeply at themselves because that their ego is so fragile. They have truly the most shame of anyone the, the most self-hatred of anyone. And so they have to project and deflect all of their faults and flaws onto other people. And that's why they are such fear-based individuals and they have to have this feeling of control all the time because it, it, they're extremely insecure. Being people who are extremely secure, they don't feel like they have to blame everything on other people. They don't feel have to feel like they have this scarcity mindset at all times. So that's you know why they're never going to be able to be in a place of self-reflection. 
people who feel good about themselves don't treat other people poorly. That, that old expression that hurt people hurt people, right? So you're never going to be able to have that opportunity for self-reflection. You're never going to be able to have that opportunity for growth. And, and they will never be able to, you know, become better versions of themselves and transform in, in leaps and bounds the way other people will because they don't self-reflect the way other people do, unfortunately. So that is a basic skill that they'll never be able to master that other people can. So that's number two. And you know, if you guys agree with me so far, put agree in the comments and let me know what you all have seen as well. The next point that a narcissist will never be able to, uh, and the next skill that a narcissist will never be able to ma uh, master is the, the art of being able to genuinely apologize. The only types of apologies that they issue are what I call faux apologies meaning fake apologies, they only use them for manipulating. You know, they won't, they won't apologize to you because they genuinely feel sorrow or, um, again, self-reflection because they actually are, um, you know, sorry for what they did. I mean, for, for some people saying sorry is an act of love. It's an act of understanding. It's an act of being, you know, um, sorry for something that you did, they, you know, but if they apologize, it's, it's because they're trying to manipulate you. Everything they do is a manipulation. It's usually because there's a catch to it or they're trying to, maybe it's sarcasm. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, you know, the fact that you were born or whatever, you know, um, I'll say sorry when you say sorry, you know, something to that effect, but they're not usually ever actually sorry. So again, a skill they cannot master. The next skill that a narcissist will never really be able to master is that true commitment, true commitment to somebody because it's, they're really only committed to a person or an organization or anything as long as it's transactional, right? Meaning, what am I getting out of this? What are you going to do for me? They're only committed to the level of what level of supply am I getting out of this? Because as long as once that level of supply, that value decreases for them, then so does your value for them. So, so does their commitment. So does their interest level. It's all about that depth that surface level. So, you know, if, if that decreases, then, you know, they will actually start justifying their behavior to go cheat or do whatever it is that they feel that they should be able to do because they're not getting their value out of the deal anymore. So, you know, if that's the case for you, then, you, you know, make sure that you're taking care of yourself, make sure you're getting the support that you need. Go join my free private Facebook group at Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. You get the help and support that you need because you don't want to try to do this alone because it's too difficult. And if you are negotiating with a narcissist, get my free Crush My Negotiation Prep Worksheet at winmynegotiation.com. Because you do want to be able to negotiate properly. It's a free 15-page e-booklet, and it will help you negotiate properly. So the next skill that a, a narcissist will never be able to master is listening. I mean, they'll never be able to listen properly. I mean, they, they could literally directly ask you a question, and how are you, blah, 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 I want to really know. And then the next thing you know, they're looking at their phone, or if they see somebody at a party and they're, they're more interested in that, they're off. I mean, they literally don't care. Try, you're trying to talk to them. They will literally interrupt you. They would, are just waiting their turn. They're really more interested in you hearing them or speaking than understanding. They don't care what you have to say. They will interrupt you. They'll accuse you of interrupting. It's an endless 
the horrible conversation. The next skill that a narcissist will never be able to master is being alone. They hate to be alone. That is their worst fear. As much as they treat you poorly, le you leaving them is their worst fear. Their worst fear. That's why it's like push-pull all the time. They, they treat you poorly because they need somebody to push down and treat poorly. But as soon as you go to leave, oh my God, don't leave. Now my supply is walking out the door. They don't want that. That's very daunting for them. The next skill a nar narcissist will never be able to master is accepting responsibility. They've got to shift that blame somewhere else, even though it's fully their, res their responsibility. All barrels could be pointing at them. It's definitely somebody else's fault. They will never admit fault, even if it's glaringly obvious that it is their fault. I have been in court before and literally have had a, another attorney where it, it, the transcript was very obvious what the other attorney said. And the other attorney has absolutely said, I know that that's what the transcript said, but that is not what the truth is. It is absolutely crazy, but they will never admit fault even when it's glaringly obvious, even when it's printed on a page, even if a text message says something, even if an email says something, they will never admit fault. They will absolutely shift blame no matter what. So, and the last point, you ready? You, you ready for the last skill that a narcissist will never be able to master no matter what, you know it, genuine gratitude. They're never going to acknowledge you no matter what, no matter how good you've been. They cannot bring themselves to be grateful for you. Don't sit around and wait for it. You know, I, and there's so so many things that I always say. You, you cannot sit around and say that they're going to acknowledge you, see your side. You know, they, they just feel entitled. They just feel entitled. So gratitude is not their first reaction. Although they think that you should be grateful, they understand the under the the the, the concept of gratitude, but only when it's flowing that direction, not this. There are ten things that a narcissist just simply cannot do. I know you think they are all powerful, all knowing, and all seeing. They want you to think that. They want you to think that they are like the great and powerful Oz, like in the Wizard of Oz. I often say that narcissists are like the Wizard of Oz. They are like, seriously, they layer it all on like the powerful Wizard of Oz. You're going to Oz and you, you think they're so powerful and so knowing and so you've got to go there, but they're really like the man behind the curtain, like so feeble and like not much going on. And you are actually the way more powerful one. You actually are. That actually is the truth. They are actually way more afraid of you than you are of them. And there really are a lot of things that they can't do. There really are a lot of things. And especially when you are negotiating with them. Hey, I'm Rebecca Zung and I am an attorney. I am a narcissist negotiation expert. And before we go any further, I want to make sure that I tell you to subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell because on this channel and in my videos, I give you tips, tricks, and resources to shift the dynamic, shift that power so that you can become the most powerful person when you are dealing with narcissists, the most toxic personality on the planet. And I upload brand new videos every single day, free content. What other lawyer is doing that? No one else. So make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell. All right, so guess what? I'm gonna give you 10 tips the best one is at the end. So you're going to want to make sure you stay till the end. The best one is at the end. All right, ready? Number one, number one, number one, a narcissist cannot take criticism. They cannot take it. Their fragile little egos cannot take it. You know, that's true. They're so easily slighted. And sometimes like you're not even criticizing them. You just like even look the wrong way. 
right? And they're like slighted. I always say they hear tones in your voice, like dogs hear whistles. Like even if there's no tone, they heard tone. They cannot take criticism, all right? So that's number one. Number two, they cannot handle you being away from them. They cannot handle you ghosting them. They cannot handle you like dishing out some of your own medicine to them. Like if you start to ghost them a little bit, like you don't text them back right away. And just like they do to you, you know, a little dish of their own medicine, they cannot handle that. Just like what they've done to you, they cannot handle a little dose of their own medicine back to them, right? They go absolutely insane if you do that. I mean, you know that's true. They'll show up at your house or office. They start flooding you. They can't take that. Number three, they can't have a normal relationship. They try to, but they really can't. And that's really, really sad. You know, you know that they're lying all the time. They lie even when they don't need to. That's the thing that I think is really very puzzling sometimes. Like they lie even when they don't have to, even about things that are easily verifiable. And even when it's to their own detriment, a lot of times they're just incapable of it because they're just not healthy people. Unfortunately, you know, they have no sense of self as much as they try. They can't be in a normal, healthy relationship. And number four, they can't be vulnerable because they can't be in a normal, healthy relationship. You know, something happened to them when they were younger, when something, you know, when they were in those formative years that made them think that the world was a very scary place. And so they're constantly in a state of survival. You know, it's almost like they do show that vulnerability that they feel like they'll be eaten in a way, you know, it's like for them to survive, they have to be in this fight or flight mode at all times. It's, it's very sad. And so hand in hand with that is number five, which is they really can't show genuine emotion. They, they don't have that ability to have any feeling of care or empathy for other people because it's almost like for them to eat, nobody else can eat. And so they're like vultures sort of picking the carcass of other, like, is there food still left in this carcass? I always liken it to like, you know, if I'm starving, I can't think about it, whether or not somebody else needs food right now because I'm so starving all the time. And so that's what's really going on. And that's why they can't really show genuine emotion about anybody else. And that's why they really can't allow themselves to have that genuine emotion and allow themselves to be vulnerable and allow themselves to have that normal, healthy relationship. That's what's really going on. It's just this underlying thing. And so when you're, when you're going to negotiate with them, it's even worse because, you know, you become public enemy number one. And when you're dealing with them in a negotiation setting, you know, it's you are now for them or against them. And when you're against them, you're public enemy number one. And you have to remember that when you're dealing with them in a negotiation setting. And that's where I come in and, and help you understand that when you're dealing with them in a, a conversational situation, when you're trying to have those hard conversations, when you're trying to have those conversations in a toxic situation. You're definitely going to want to check out my video on the 12 things that narcissists don't do because that goes hand in hand with this video as well. It really is very sad. It's very sad. And if you agree with me, just put very sad in the comments because it's too bad for them that they can't feel that. But by the way, you can't fix that. So don't think that you can. Don't think that you can fix that. All right, so number six, number six goes hand in hand with some of the other things that I've been saying, and that is that they can't be authentic because they can't have that normal, healthy relationship. 
So they can't show that genuine emotion. So they can't be authentic as well. Don't think that you're going to be able to fix them. Don't think that you're going to be able to have them show that genuine emotion. And don't think that you're going to be able to have them admit their vulnerabilities or things like that. Okay. Okay. Number seven, number seven is a narcissist cannot give credit to others. They cannot acknowledge others for things that they've done. They cannot give credit to others because it just, it gives away from that sense of self, which they don't have. When they don't have any sense of self, they cannot give credit to others. That's why they do the withhold. They cannot give anything. It's almost like when you're starving, you cannot give away anything. And believe me, I know when I was dealing with this, when in a business situation, I mean, even if you give, 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 like no matter how much you give, they cannot give any credit for no matter what it is that you've done. They will not acknowledge you for that. Number eight, number eight is they will never admit that they were wrong. No matter what, they will never admit that they were wrong. They will never apologize. I mean, it, unless they have to for strategic reasons or something like that, but they will never actually apologize and actually mean it. All right. Number nine, they will never genuinely be happy for other people's successes. Oh, I mean, they just, they cannot bring themselves. They're so jealous. Again, it goes back to that very, very fragile sense of self. When you don't have that inner sense of value, you just, you can't be happy for others. It's, it's so sad, but it's just so true. I mean, when you feel good about yourself, you can feel good about other people. But if you don't feel good inside, you don't feel good about other people, unfortunately. And number 10, I told you I was going to save the best for last. This is like the paradox. This is the irony of narcissists. This is the one I find so mind blowing about them. And that is that they cannot handle being alone. They're so horrible to you. And yet they don't want you to leave. They cannot handle you leaving them. They don't want to be alone, but yet they were so awful to you. Yep. So true. They cannot handle being alone, but yet they're so terrible to you, but you can't be responsible for them. You can't fix it. You can't save it. The three C's, you didn't cause it. You can't control it. You can't cure it. So let's talk about what narcissists can't control. I mean, one of the things that happens with narcissists is that they want to control everything. That's part of how they get their supply. And if you want to know what it looks like when a narcissist is losing control, check out my video on signs that a narcissist is losing control. And you'll hear all about that. It's, let me tell you, it's not a pretty, pretty sight, but they do lose control sometimes. But what are the things that they can't control at all? I mean, they need to be able to control as much as they possibly can. And a lot of what they do is trying to control you because that's how they get that narcissistic supply. And it really happens when you're dealing with them in some kind of a dispute or a case or something like that. If you're dealing with them in a negotiation setting, such as in a divorce or a business situation. I also have had a lot of people re reach out to me that are dealing with narcissists in a probate dispute or something like that. So if you're dealing with a narcissist in any kind of situation like that, you're go going to see their characteristics, their narcissistic characteristics go crazy. It goes even higher. It's like whatever they were before, now here it is on steroids because the mask is getting ripped off. They want to get to you before you can get to them. They want to be the one that looks like the, the wonderful one in the situation. They want to make sure that you look as bad as possible and they just want to take you down. So, you know, scorched earth litigation and all those terms that have come about, you know, about people who overly litigate or highly litigate cases, all of those people are probably narcissists who've gotten involved with that because they want to destroy you. 
I mean, that's really what it is. And, and for them, it's survival. For them, it's like, in order for me to prevail, you have to be destroyed. It can't be that you nicely walk away from each other. I tried to do that with a couple of narcissists in my life. Didn't work. I mean, as much as I tried to keep the peace, and I'm a person who wants to try to, you know, maintain relationships with people, even if we're saying goodbye, because that's what makes it, you know, easier. You never know when you want to maybe go, you know, talk to that person again or, or see them again. You never know. But hey, when you're, when, it deal, when you're dealing with narcissists, it can't be that way. They feel that they have to get you before you can get them. So that's why they have this ultimate need for control. They have to get, get that control over you, especially when you're in that discard phase. So one of the things that they definitely cannot control are your thoughts the way you think. I mean, you can look at them and you can, you know, think whatever you want to think and they can try to make you think a certain way, but they're, they, they can't actually get control of your thoughts. You know, I, I've often referred to the book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, you know, it's because that caged bird, your thoughts, your soul, the, the essence of you can never be controlled by somebody unless you give them permission to. So one of the things that you can definitely, definitely can't control are your thoughts unless you allow it. All right. So that's number one. The next thing that a narcissist cannot control are your emotions. And this is one of the hardest things to do because especially, you know, when you talk about your thoughts, your emotions, things like that, they've worked so hard to get into your thinking, to get into your pa patterns of thought and, and create that you know, trauma bond that it's really hard to, you know, it's really easy for me to sit here and say, yeah, they can't control it. They can't, your thoughts, they can't control your emotions. But I recognize this is a really hard thing to do and, and that you have to just learn how to pivot. And the first step in learning how to control your thoughts and your emotions and not allowing the narcissist to have control over those things is by recognizing that this is what's going on by watching videos like this one and, and other videos on my channel and others of us in the field who talk about narcissism and you can start to learn that this is a disorder that these are people who are very broken. These are people who have been hurt. And, you know, there's an old saying that says, hurt people hurt people. You know, people who have been hurt, who have been wounded, they end up hurting other people. And that's what happens with narcissists. They were hurt at some point during their childhood. Something caused them to you know, feel that the world is a bad place and they have to survive. And in order to survive, it's me or you. And it's not going to be, you know, me that ends up going down. So it's got to be you. And so they, you know, have created this pattern of, of thinking and this way of being in the world that um, is a scared way. And, and they're very scared. They're very frightened little creatures. That's the secret about, about narcissists. You're actually the stronger one. You're actually the one who has um, way more of a sense of self. They attach themselves to you as a form of supply because you had so much value. So they then embed these thing, these, these thoughts into your brain where you start to create these neuronal patterns of thinking that you need them or thinking that you can't live without them or thinking that they're more powerful than you or thinking that they're smarter than you or smarter than everybody else. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I'll never be able to win because they always win. They're always more powerful than I am. They always get their way. And it sometimes feels that way with narcissists because they can t ride that, that, that level of entitlement and confident that, you know, that 
pretend confidence that they exude all the way to very high positions sometimes and really getting people to believe that they know more, that they're smarter, that they're better in a lot of ways. But the truth of the matter is they don't feel that way inside. And the first step to really taking that mask off and really for you to, to, to distance yourself from the situation is by realizing what it is that you're looking at, realizing what is going on with them and understanding that it's not you, that it's them. And so once you start to do that, you can actually start to take the emotion out of it and start looking at it as if you're reporting the news. And that's when you can start actually not even getting into the vortex of negative emotion, not allowing them to drag you down, drag you into the mud with them by staying um, out of that. And so, you know, you just have to start it one step at a time, maybe just one encounter at a time, like maybe just decide, okay, for this particular encounter, I am not going to get engaged. I am not going to feel any emotion about this. I'm going to just watch what they're doing and I'm going to just observe as an, you know, as almost as a third party observer and just try it once. And once you, you try it once, then you can say, okay, I did it. Look at me. I did it. Let me try that one again and see how that goes. And if you are so ready to have this and just like feel like I got this, give me an I got this in the comments. So the last thing that a narcissist cannot control is your response to a situation, to your response to what they do. I mean, they can do whatever they want and they will do whatever they want. You cannot control a narcissist. You can't, you know, go get in there and change them. They're really, you know, people that can't be rehabilitated unless they would really, really want to be, which most of them don't. I mean, m m most narcissists really will never go get the help that they need and really get the, the, you know, retraining of the brain that is what would be needed in order for them to become, you know, like normal people. And so the best thing that you can do is start to learn how to control your response to a situation. You know, when you are presented with something inflammatory, you can just take a deep breath and say, I, I can see that you're upset. I know that's how you feel. I acknowledge that what you said is this. And, and just, you know, say it as if you are a person who is just observing. And that's where you're, 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 you're controlling your thoughts, you're controlling your emotions, you're controlling your response to the situation. And once you start doing that, then you will start to feel more and more powerful. And it will, that, that power that you start to feel when you just take one little baby step at a time will actually start permeate, permeating the rest of your life. I've had clients that have told me that by standing up to their narcissistic exes, they've actually now become more powerful and more confident in business and in all of their dealings. They've actually you know, ended up feeling better than they ever have because they were able to just start taking baby steps. If you want to take that dynamic and start shifting it around 180 degrees so that you start feeling like you're on the offensive rather than on the defensive, so that you start feeling like you're driving the ship instead of somebody else, so that you feel like you are the one in control and not just responding to what everybody, you know, what the other, the narcissist is doing. This is the way to do it. You just start taking one step at a time. And eventually you start to feel, wait a minute, look, look at what I've done. Oh my gosh, things have changed so much. And you'll see that the narcissist will start to change too, because if they're not getting the supply out of you that they want, then they're going to start to lose interest. And, and they'll also start to realize that the things that you're that they normally were able to do in order to get a rise out of you, they can't do anymore. So your thoughts, your emotions, your responses, those are the things that a narcissist cannot control about you. And I want you to very much remember that. And if you are getting ready to negotiate with a narcissist, five unspoken regrets of narcissists. They don't talk about it because they don't want you to know that they can be weak.
but they can. They have regrets sometimes. They're not the same kinds of regrets that regular reasonable people have. You know, regular reasonable people can regret things like normal people have, you know, but these are their own special kinds of regrets. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about them today in this video. So you're going to want to watch all the way till the end because there's a special kind of regret that's only reserved for narcissists. And I'm going to be talking about at the end here. All right. So Number one, they regret that they can't love themselves more. I know, but this is actually, we should all be able to love ourselves in a certain way. You know, self-love is a really important thing, but this is not a, a normal type of thing, right? With narcissists, they truly have no inner sense of value. That's what it really means to be a narcissist. They're just like a shell inside. It's an empty space. They feel truly empty inside. And, and that's so unfortunate. That's why they're constantly trying to layer on these feelings of, you know, external value from external sources, which we call narcissistic supply. But it's almost like this sieve inside or this, you know, there's just no way to catch that feeling, this empty black hole. And so, you know, you're constantly trying to fill the black hole. They want you to fill it. So you're left feeling totally and utterly depleted. They're left still feeling empty. And, you know, it's this endless cycle, unfortunately, I always say that they're sort of like the hollow chocolate Easter bunnies. You know, they look very pretty on the outside, but inside there's nothing going on. And unfortunately, they really do regret being unable to love themselves more. They can fake it. They're very, very good at mirroring what's going on. They're very, very good at reading people. It's kind of a survival skill that they've developed since childhood. But deep down, they just don't feel worthy of that love. And, you know, so you empaths out there, I see you out there, you think that you're going to be able to love them back to health and you feel like you're going to be able to give them all this love. And it, it's an interesting because I was actually – talking to somebody yesterday who was interviewing me and this person was talking about how she had been in a relationship with a narcissist and she was like well you know I hadn't grown up with a whole lot of love in my life or you know unconditional love and I just thought well I don't need a whole lot I can just give and I won't need to get a whole lot in return. So I'll just give and give and give to this person and it, it'll be okay. And I'll love this person back to health. And I'm going to prove to this person how much I love them. And it's so common with these empaths and narcissists and how they end up finding each other. You know, I actually have a whole video on the empath and the narcissist, which you guys can watch that video as well. But, you know, they just often feel this great deal of regret that there's they're never going to be able to truly experience that internal feeling of self-love. So that's number one, that they have this unspoken regret that they're never going to be able to love themselves more. So that's number one. Number two, they really do regret this, the, the underlying feeling that they have of being so insecure. They do know that internally they have this insecurity. They're constantly trying to cover it up. And, and obviously all of us have insecurities. All of us have this feeling of trying to look good, avoid looking bad. Who wants to have that? I mean, we all kind of have that to a certain degree. And narcissism is, you know, on a spectrum. But if you truly have narcissistic personality disorder, this insecurity leads them to engage in 
defensive, aggressive behavior, which causes them to put people down, start arguments, especially on, you know, holidays, people's birthdays, you know, if they feel like they're going to be threatened in some way, if they feel like they're not going to be the center of attention, all of the things that narcissists do, right, that cause them to be narcissists. And ultimately, it ends up damaging their relationship and creating unpleasant environments for everybody around them and everybody involved. And, and ultimately, their insecurities many times sabotage their relationships and, sab and sabotage a lot of things for them in, in a lot of ways that they sometimes don't even realize because people just don't want to be around them. They do regret this deep down feeling of insecurity. They have this split thing going on because they have this true self and this false self going on constantly. And this false self is this uh, outside personality that they've created and the true self is the one in internally that they have. So that's number two. Number three is sometimes they regret not being able to control their emotions because depending on the level of, of narcissists that you're dealing with, they really don't have the ability to control their emotions. How a narcissist was formed, created, was during childhood when they were constantly exposed to trauma, their brain was in this fight or flight mode when all of us are in fight or flight mode our brain emits chemicals in order to allow us to be better, stronger, or faster so that we can run, so that we can fight, so that we can, you know, take care of ourselves. But those chemicals caused their brains to actually have, you know, arrested development, that limbic part of their brain. And what happens with narcissists is that part of their brain, that limbic part of their brain, was not then fully formed when they are then presented with situations where they feel that they are threatened, then that narcissistic injury then becomes triggered and that narcissistic rage then comes flying out and you are dealing with somebody who is not rational and not reasonable, and they then are being controlled by their emotions and not by being a rational, reasonable adult at that point. And it can lead to outbursts of anger and hurtful words, and they say things in the heat of the moment, and this lack of emotional control can cause them to be unstable and unpredictable, which can be obviously very off-putting to others. I think that sometimes they do regret that because, again, it sabotages relationships, it can sabotage business deals for them at times, you know, many times will never regret that. They'll say, oh, that's how I wanted it. I didn't like that person. That's how it should have gone in the first place. So that person's a loser or whatever it is that they're going to say about it. They will oftentimes regret that that's how it ended up going down. And they'll oftentimes regret their behavior in that moment. So that is another unspoken regret of a narcissist. So five unspoken regrets of narcissists. Number Three is they regret not being able to control their emotions. Number four is they do regret that they can't empathize with others. And this is something that they do recognize that regular, reasonable people, normal human beings, you have that ability. And, you know, covert narcissists do develop the ability to mirror or say the right thing. So if they're a true narcissist, they know that they don't actually feel it inside. And if you're with a covert narcissist for a long period of time, you inherently know that they don't actually feel it 
you, you have that feeling in your gut that that person doesn't actually care, you can, you can tell when somebody truly cares and, or when somebody's actually just going through the motions or saying the words. A true narcissist just doesn't actually care if somebody's child died or dog got run over in the street or whatever. They don't actually care about those things and they have to learn how to pretend to feel things for others or fit into society in that way because they don't actually you know they have to remember to say the right things or remember to care or know what it looks like to be understanding you know otherwise they they know that they're they're not going to fit in so they wish and have regret about the fact that they don't actually have the ability to empathize with others it can also make them quick to anger slow to forgive which again can damage relationships and you know so they oftentimes don't have a lot of good relationships a lot of friends you know many people don't hang around with them for very long because of their inability to be able to form good relationships or have closeness with others because obviously if you don't truly care about people Many people aren't going to hang around with you for very long, right? So we've gotten through the first four, five unspoken regrets of narcissists. So recapping, number one was they regret not being able to love themselves more. Number two is they regret being so insecure. Number three was they regret not being able to control their emotions. Number four was they regret not being able to empathize with others. Who can guess what number five is? And by the way, if you agree with me so far, give me a yes in the comments. Totally agree, right? Give me a yes in the comments. You know that everything I said, I speak the truth so far, right? Ready for number five? All right, number five is they regret not being able to truly connect with other people. And that's really what it's all about because we all want to feel that true love and connection with other human beings on the planet. We all do want to be able to inherently feel that. And unfortunately, as a narcissist, it is extremely difficult for them to be able to feel that. And I know you guys are mostly empaths out there watching me and you feel like you can save them or whatever it is that you're doing, but you're literally going to take yourself out if you feel like you can do that because you can't, you are going to drown trying to save them. You can't because they can't be rehabilitated. It's sort of like, you know, an addict or something. They have to want to save themselves and they, they can't. So you got to save yourself. You got to put your own oxygen mask on here first. The way that you do that is by self-care, taking care of yourself, putting boundaries on in, in place, right? And I've helped thousands and thousands of people negotiate. I've seen them all. I've seen narcissists at their best and I've seen them at their worst. And I've seen how they cannot accept this one single quality. So what do you think that it is? Well, they have a difficult time accepting criticism of any form. They have to see themselves as perfect, or at least they want the world to see themselves as perfect. They cannot have anyone point out anything that looks like any form of criticism of any kind. So they can't take responsibility for their actions. 
They often react with defensiveness. That's why they have everybody else take responsibility for their own actions. That's why they're constantly projecting and deflecting. Their sense of self is just so fragile. It's just so fragile. You know, they have no internal sense of value. And, and that's why anything that looks or smells like a slight is just, you know, this almost shattering to them. And, and so that's why they can't apologize unless it's a manipulation of some sort. That's why everything has to be somebody else's fault. Potentially exposing them is absolutely your best leverage because of that. And so if anyone or anybody thinks that they're not as great as either they want you to think that they, they are, or this picture that they think that they're painting of themselves as they think that they are, they will react with anger, defensiveness, or even rage. And they will just try to discredit you, discredit anyone that they think has criticized them, make you think that you're wrong for even speaking up for it. But it's all because they feel such deep shame inside and they want you to feel small. They build themselves up to try to make you feel small. They can't handle not being told that they're absolutely perfect. And this is why they try to align themselves with people who they think are higher or better or more respected because they think it makes themselves look higher, better, more respected. I mean, they'll do anything to avoid looking bad. They can't accept this criticism. They need to be the center of attention. They have this grandiose sense of self-importance. They need to, they desperately need this adulation. They desperately need to feel important. They use people in order to make themselves feel more important. This need that's so desperate that they can't even feel anything for anyone else. It's not that, oh, I don't want to feel anything for anyone, so let me go use people. It's, it's because they have this need that's so ruthless and so painful almost that's why they can't feel anything for anyone else. I mean, it is a personality disorder. It, it is an absolute on the books disorder. So the one quality that they absolutely cannot accept is that they're not perfect. They, they know deep down inside that they're not, but they don't want to be told that. And they certainly don't want you to know that. And they certainly don't want the world to see that. So they will go to any lengths to make sure that that facade is protected. And how does that show up? It shows up in so many different ways. They can't accept criticism. They can't accept responsibility for their behaviors. They can't accept being told that they're not perfect. They can't accept that they're not always right. They're unable to accept negative feedback. They're unable to accept that other people have different opinions than their own. All of those things are manifestations that they're not perfect. You know, they, they can't accept that responsibility for their behaviors. That's why they have to project and deflect, lie and deny. Every single one of those things that I just mentioned are manifestations of the same thing, which is... The one quality that they cannot accept, which is that they're not perfect. Now, when you go to negotiate with this narcissist, when you go to try to have a conversation with them in a negotiation setting, how does that manifest itself? You're going to be dealing with somebody who's constantly playing games. You cannot tell them, oh, this is what you did wrong or this is how your behavior was poor, anything that shows up like that, you're going to be getting backlash right at you. So you kind of have to play the game with them a little bit, right? 
You have to act like, you know, maybe you're going along until you're ready to expose them. You know, you have to create leverage in the right way because, you know, you're going through the different phases with them. And, and that all shows up in that discard phase. And, you know, in the discard phase, they're going to be lining up their flying monkeys. They're going to be, you know, in that discard phase. That is when you see the birth of the smear campaign. But why, why do they do that? Well, because they want to get to you before you can get to them because they don't want you to expose them as not being perfect. So let's talk about the five questions that narcissists, they can't answer. So the first one is anything that involves the truth. <laughs> they can't answer anything that involves the truth. And here's the weird thing about them is that they're pathological liars. And I think you probably figured that out already by now. But what I find really strange about narcissists is that they will lie about anything, including things they don't even need to lie about and including things that are readily verifiable. It's so strange for me to, to you know, as a person who I always say that integrity is my love language, uh, but I, I don't understand, but I've seen it happen. I mean, I've seen situations where, uh, you know, I saw one time where a wife actually p kicked the 14 year old son out of the house at like one o'clock in the morning because she lost her temper on him, threw all his stuff outside, all out on the lawn. The husband, soon to be ex husband, had to go pick up the son, pick up all his stuff, gather stuff up off the, off the lawn, put it in the car at one o'clock in the morning. And the soon to be ex wife then writes an email to the husband saying, this is probably for the best, give everybody a chance to cool down. Uh, you should probably contact the school bus service so that they know to pick him up over by your house and we'll all just take a break. Next thing you know, she files a motion and writes under oath that the husband stole the child from him and basically kidnapped him and took him without her permission and all this stuff when it's like readily verifiable because of the email that she sent to him that same night. It's kind of crazy, but anything that involves the truth are questions that they can't answer. Like if you asked her why she did that, she wouldn't be able to give an answer. So anything that involves the truth, anything that involves calling them out on their behavior, uh, they like to deny, deflect, de de you know, project, uh, making sure it's not coming on to them uh, and or anything that shows that, you know, you know what's going on, you know, again, part of the truth. Uh, and if you want to know more, by the way, on what narcissists do when they get caught in a lie, you should definitely check out my video on what happens when you catch a narcissist in a lie. Um, but they just can't answer any questions that involve the truth. So the next thing is anything that involves giving credit to someone else. You know, if you ask them, you know, who was responsible for creating this amazing party or uh, coming up with this incredible idea at work or something like that, they cannot, they cannot bring themselves to give credit to anyone else. Um, you know, if you ask, what does this person contribute? Or what did, what, how, what benefit do you get in your life from this person? They can't answer it. They, they because they live in scarcity mentality. It really is scarcity, men, scarcity mentality at its most extreme. And, and as I've said before, in my opinion, narcissists are, you know, there's the pathological ones that are actually diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And it's an actual legit personality disorder. But I, you know, I believe that it's a, it's a continuum. It's a spectrum. You know, all of us want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter. So, you know, um, there are times when we all feel sort of selfish or we've all been guilty of behavior that's not the greatest, right? But this is like all the time. These are people that they're so living in scarcity mentality that to give anything to someone else would mean that somehow they don't exist or they collapse because their sense of self is so fragile. Um, so 
anything that, that involves giving credit to someone else is just something that they cannot do. It's really hard to say that this person is, um, you know, really great at this, or my life is so much better because of this person or whatever. It's really, really hard for them to do that. Number three is anything involving them failing or, or losing. If you ask them questions about their loss or um, failing at something, they, they're just, they can't accept it. I mean, they, they distort reality. They have this magical thinking, which is all part of the DSM-5, which is how they actually diagnose narcissists. They distort reality. They, they, they just live in their own world. And so anything involving them being called out as failing at something or uh, losing is just something that they cannot, they cannot have a conversation about. The fourth thing is anything involving shame or vulnerability. You know, they are protecting that with their lives. I mean, they, they have an, an enormous sense of shame, actually, um, because they, they have this fragile sense of self that they're constantly trying to protect, and they want the world to think that they're this person. So there's this dichotomy that they're constantly living in where you know, they, there's a scared, fragile little person that's hidden somewhere deep inside. And on the outside, they want you to believe that they are strong and powerful or confident, or if it's a covert narcissist, then it's more like they are, you know, a victim maybe, or um, that they're kind, but there's this underlay of rage. If you, if you want to know more about covert narcissists, definitely check out my video on covert narcissism in relationships. Um, but, you know, that's some of the things that you'll see. Um, and then the next one is anything that involves how well they interact with others because they're not great at interacting with others. They're not great at maintaining friendships. If, if you've seen this, by the way, I want to see um, agreed in the chat below that you've seen this before, but they, they're not great at, ha at having maintaining close friendships or intimacy or anything like that. So they don't want to be asked about how well they interact with others. So that's, that's the fifth thing. Those are the five questions they can't answer. Anything that involves a truth, anything that gives credit to anyone else, anything that involves them failing or losing, anything involving shame or vulnerability, or anything that involves how well they interact with others. So if you do ask them these questions, what will you see instead? You'll see vague answers. You'll see gaslighting. You'll see lying and denying. Um, and you'll see projection. You'll see blaming and shaming others. Um, they're going to want to throw you off the scent because they want you to be uncertain. They want you to be unstable. And you will see this, especially in negotiations, because remember with the narcissist, you're either for them or you're against them. So once they know that you're no longer for them, then they're going to go after you with uh, guns blazing. Um, you're going to be coming public enemy number one. Um, and they want you to be unstable. They want you to be uncertain. They want you to think they want to believe that you don't see what's actually going on. All right. So, and when the narcissist knows, you know, mm -hmm. that's another one of my videos you should definitely check out. So those are the questions that narcissists just, they can't answer. 